Major funding for these programs is made possible by grants from Chase Commercial Term Lending, New York Community Bank, Capital One Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, M&T Bank, Customers Bank, Genova Burns, Terra CRG, Meridian Capital Group. Additional support is made possible by AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Aerial Property Advisors, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Laumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Citizens Bank, Colliers International, NYC, Collins Building Services, CPEX Real Estate Services, Cushman and Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Eastern Union Funding, Fisher Brothers, First Nationwide Title Agency, Flushing Bank, Friedman, Handler Real Estate Organization, HAP Investments, Hersha Hospitality, Hodges Ward Elliott, Inc., Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Madison Realty Capital, Matone Group, Mercantile Commerce Bank, New Banks, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rosewood Realty Group, SJP Properties, Sterling National Bank, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, The Continuum Company, The Moynian Group, and these friends. Retail. Everybody loves to shop. Everybody likes all different types of retail. So what's growing? What's doing well in retail? Is it luxury? Is it fast food? Is it for the millenniums? You know, where, where is it growing in, in New York and the region? So I've assembled today this group of retail experts to provide their insight on the state of retail in the region. My guests include... Tim King, the co-founder and managing partner of CPX Real Estate. We won't call it services. Mm -hmm. John Krieger, who has a couple of lives. He's a vice president at RKF, and he is the co-founder of a wonderful coffee company called Bluestone Lane Coffee and also with the founder of Retail Works. Matt Chimilecki, who is the senior vice president for CBRE Retail Services. And last but not least... A retailer for many, many years, Aaron Malinsky, who is the president and CEO of uh, Curb Cut Urban Partners. So, you and I have seen retail. You remember there was Bohack, there was Big Apple in the supermarket business, there was J.W. Mays, there was Kleins over there. How do you see retail today in 2016? Well, it's clearly in evolution and transition. And the biggest impact, in my opinion, as of this moment, is clearly uh, online shopping. And I've been telling uh, my colleagues that uh, when we are planning new developments now, we have to basically scale back our uh, expectations of how much retail to build. For example, I was never reluctant to build a 100,000 foot of retail stores in the 4,000 foot and down. Today, I'd be thinking about 50,000 feet. I'm not disagreeing with you, but you know, we look at what Tim did, you know, at a hundred year old building on the Sunset, Sunset Park section of Brooklyn. No one would have ever believed that Saks or Fifth, Bed Bath & Beyond, Harmon, Bye bye baby. You're good. Okay, and city market, whatever cost plus market, yep. cost plus market, would be op moving in a, into a warehouse over there. Uh, maybe one day they'll have a blue stone in one of your other companies. But how, how do you see that evolution? I mean, Aaron is correct in his thoughts that if you build too much retail, you know, it, it's not like the movie. You know, if they if they build it, they will come. 
That's the, That's the reality. So clearly I can't disagree with Aaron because he's a bright guy and has seen it all. And he's 100% right. Retail is an evolutionary, it's always a very Darwinian business. I think the success of Liberty View with bringing in a 120,000 square foot tenant and a 33,000 square foot tenant was uh, proximity to accessibility right off the BQE, a giant parking lot, and frankly, a very visionary landlord who was convinced that he had the spot for this. And there's another part of this. We talked a little earlier before we got started about uh, retailers and their activity and desire to be in our marketplace. One of the challenges, particularly in, the, in all of the boroughs, is if you have a tenant looking for a larger footprint, there's just not that many places where you could, for example, bed bath is in 120,000 square feet on, on a second floor, but it's all on one floor. So where do you find three acres of retail space with parking at this point in time, any place uh, in the five boroughs? Creativity for the larger retailers and their ability not to go with a prototype is critical. I mean, you know, the backbone of our company is having the imagination, the creativity, and the ability to execute and find the location and build vertical. But one of the other important dynamics that's occurring in our marketplace is that we have lots of great growing neighborhoods. So there is opportunity. I mean, look, look let's, let's talk about, you know, the coffee and the, the retail works. That's because of growing neighborhoods, right? Um, How old is Bluestone? We're three years old. But um, it, it's, it's, a, it's come from, you know, you talk about the evolution. The evolution is from a real estate standpoint. I think there's a revolution from a consumer standpoint. And so the, the nature of Bluestone Lane or some of the other brands that, we, um, you know, that we're rolling out is, uh, I think, is a, um, you know, comes from the changing habits and um, of consumers in any of these major metropolitan markets. So uh, you mentioned prototypes and that, you know, big box retailers have to move from that mentality. It's the same thing for smaller retailers. Consumers at our level don't want to walk into a space or a restaurant or a fitness studio and feel like they're in a chain. So the prototype mentality of, um, you know, this is our box, this is what it looks like, I don't see that working long term in, uh, you know, in the major metropolitan markets like Manhattan and Chicago and D.C. Do you agree with them? I, I do, especially with regards to, to if you just talk about your business right now with coffee. A normal person who's walking to work on, a, on any given day used to stop at Starbucks. And if a Starbucks, open, a Starbucks opened two blocks closer to them, then they'd stop at their Starbucks, and that was part of their routine. Now you're seeing with all these more gourmet coffee. Uh, artisanal coming, coffee. Artisanal coffee coming in. Third wave. You're, uh, you're seeing this be part of their you morning know, event. I, you know, I, I get up in the morning, I read my newspaper, and I go to a place called Lenwich. It's Lenny's, okay? It's not fancy, but a lot of people go in there in a similar manner. They don't have artisanal coffee. They really, you know, but it, they have tables. And certain people like that opportunity, and people know they can find me on 55th Street and 2nd Avenue sitting in the corner, okay? We, we, left, out one, we left out one thing. Yes, what? Millennials. So wait, you're saying millenniums don't go to Bed Bath & Beyond, Saks Off Fifth? Well, if you talk about what millennials are buying right now. Since you're not a millennium, don't say <laughs> uh, I'm on the cusp. Right. Uh, the biggest brands that are expanding right now are the athletic brands. We talked about yoga earlier. All these yoga, uh, from Lululemon to Sweaty Betty, uh, there's a handful of them out there right now. Uh, Adidas is expanding. Under Armour is expanding. And it's because, of, A, all these millennials are so concerned about their health that, they're all, that, that these are the clothes they're buying. And it's becoming... So am I going to see a Fitbit store soon? Uh, a Fitbit? I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised if you start seeing those, uh, those kiosks somewhere. But that, you raise the other part of the transition of retail shopping experience in that it's not just about shopping anymore. It's about exercise. It's about restaurants. It's about urgent care. So they're becoming more of the, uh, the village center. And you have to provide all sorts of services to keep the vibrancy of your shopping environment. I mean, you're involved with City Point, okay? City Point is, you know, the hub of downtown Brooklyn. 
you know, where all these new housings over there. And, you know, Century 21, the highest grossing retail store in the, in the world, perhaps, per perhaps square foot, so. uh, you know, from their lower, Manha- their lower Manhattan store. They've been in Brooklyn, but this is a new world for them. And people will run there. A city target's going over there. Trader Joe's is opening up. Uh, Alamo, movie. Alamo a movie. Okay, you know, those are different types. Plus this, not we won't call it a food court because it's not a food court. What is it called now? It's a food hall, hall. which is, let's say, a um, broad selection of artisanal food merchants. But the other important component about City Point that makes it different from the general retailing is we've created a major shopping center. A critical mass right with, within everything. You have six hundred and six hundred and fifty out of a, of, a, of a million eight. Right. So it's a it's a large one, uh, but I could see perhaps in a certain manner I could see you you represent Shake Shack. I yes. could see them being part of that because they're, they, they're, they're a few blocks away now though. Okay, but I could have you know what? But could, but could you put a second store in there and not cannibalize the street store? It's a no. I, question. I firmly believe with all the retail coming in. There are two different ends of downtown Brooklyn, and you could be on both sides. The city's still under retail, if you really have to look at it. Okay? Right. In a big way. Big way. Big, big, city, big way. You know, based on the number of people, the city is under mm-hmm. retail, but, you know, you have to have the, the right proximity. I mean, 15 years ago, would you think there would be a Whole Foods, a Trader Joe's, an Apple store opening up in Williamsburg in such a short area? I mean, no. even, look, let's look at Harlem today. Uh, Harlem had Harlem, USA, like 15 years ago. Then there was a small amount of things that would open up quietly. Uh, and, and now you have, uh, you have Sutton's property over there. You have Whole Foods. You have a variety of other things. So the city has expanded. And, and Matt was saying prior to the show, don't be surprised to see a Shake Shack perhaps in Washington Heights. Well, those areas have gentrified. Right. So that the density was there. That it's, it's, that's a change in community. So, I, right. I have to disagree. When you talk about the Bronx, the Bronx, uh, not, no, not the Washington Bronx. Heights. Okay. Okay. This well, Washington he's talking Heights. about 125th and, and, Street and, and Washington Heights. And John's yeah. right; they are gentrifying. But they're, but if you if you were to look at the area of sh- where Shake Shack is expanding in Washington Heights, it's two blocks long. If you were going to look at the area on 125th Street where we'd like to be, it's two avenue blocks long. The gentrification is there, but it's it's slowly moving out, and you just need to be more specialized and focused in your view. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you're heavily involved with retail leasing. Who do you, who's coming to the places uh, looking around? Who are the tenants? It's a combination of two worlds. It's the, the new tenants like the boutique or artisanal foods and coffee. And it's the classic retailers. I mean, folks like a Target uh, want to be any place where they're not going to cannibalize an existing store. But it's back to that issue of finding a, a building that can accommodate their needs. I think that if I could make a Broad generalization, you know, real estate is both the ultimate um, evolutionary, revolutionary business. It's very Darwinian, concepts come and go. But at the same time, it's the ultimate supply and demand business. And for as long as I have been in this business, in my opinion, the demand has almost always exceeded the supply. But there's the other important component in the boroughs of New York is that many of the national retailers have not recognized that we have fabulous communities, and that's why I look at the Bronx. The Bronx isn't being gentrified. The people that are living there are getting the opportunity to move up the social and economic ladder. Right, and they didn't have the stores before to accommodate them, okay? That that was the, the situation. Uh, it was the accommodation. Now, I don't want to be the, 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 the naysayer on the world, but I do remember recessions, and with certain recessions take place, certain type of retailers who might be, you know, and I think I mentioned this to you yesterday. The restaurant guys said to me, you know, when the 2001 recession and 9-11 and the 2009 recession came out, the amount of fine wine sold in some of the better restaurants was reduced to beer. So, you know, it's fine, but when you go in and you spend $4 for a cup of coffee or something like that, it's a different thing. My my greatest phenomenon is that I pay cash when I go to get a cup of coffee in the morning. And I watch everybody with a credit card. Maybe it's... With well, their phone, even. 
With and so, so we easy. just added level up to all of our stores. And, and so now, you know, a good percentage of our customers play with their phone. And so, and, and the space that we're playing in, if you will, is, 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 is not luxury by any means. You know, you, you mentioned that to me, you know, what happens in the, in, the, in the recession. And you saw that statistic where fine wines dropped and we're not in that space. We're not in, we're not in but fine we, dining and we're not in, you but, know. But we did bring out, and Aaron brought up the situation that Starbucks is negotiating a lease in one of his properties over here. And they said, now we want to sell wine and craft beer. So they're increasing the situation. You know, I think one of the greatest examples of the, the food trends would be the, across the street from the 200th uh, Park Avenue. Uh, there was this vacant space on the corner for years. Shelly Fireman said to me, you know, I've been pushed to look at it. Shelly says, nah, not going to work. It's never going to be there. And it's really a great food market. It's One, a food yeah. market that's doing well. Now, I will tell you that I saw the food market that at, the, at, at Penn Station, you know, near the garden, and I think it's a terrible one. I think it was just they put four or five items, and it's not, it doesn't have enough variety over there. That's where City Point will be different. You do need the critical mass. You need enough product and diversity to make it become a destination for folks. We'll have 25,000 square feet just dedicated. Right. My office is at 200 Park. And that uh, urban space is what you're talking about right, across from 45th Street. It's fantastic. The, you could tell that they handpicked the most artisanal, mm -hmm. uh, the most popular, young, hip brands. Uh, With the food. exception they missed the best coffee and the craft they beer. Did. They, did, they did. John will get in there. They did. Okay. John will find you know, a way I, in. We like that plug, okay. The, <laughs> it was, that's, that was surprising, the, the, the Penn Station uh, deal. Penn Station is Because terrible. from my understanding, um, and I, I actually I haven't, been in it, but, um, and I've heard that the retailers are doing very well, but I think um, that Ed Ho as soon as Ed Hogan came into Vornado is when they started that, um, mm -hmm. and Ed really was behind all of Brookfield Place, which is a case study globally for a food hall. What about, you know, we were talking about outlet centers, you know, outlet centers have done well in certain parts of the metropolitan area. New Jersey outlet centers have done well. A couple of Long Island outlet centers have done well. Woodbury Commons, you don't have to say done well. It's, it's the most successful around. What about our discussion before about the uh, outlet center, who has a good number of tenants signed, you know, in Staten Island? In, in my opinion, I think the outlet center will do well because people like a bargain. I also believe it will attract the tourists because you can take a very nice boat ride. There's no better boat ride in the city of New York. Uh, will it be an economic success overall for everybody? They'll probably go through several transformations. But fundamentally, value shopping on Staten Island in that particular location, I think it's a, a winner. My comment about that is that if you just go a little bit over the bridge, if you're in a car and you don't want to pay any sales tax on your clo clothing, all you do is go to New Jersey. How much is that toll? Eight and a half percent. You know, it depends. It's, uh, it's a question of what you spend. You're, you're, you're a big luxury guy. Yes. So what's up with the luxury market in, in our market today? If you look at uh, Madison Avenue, there's... A good amount of availability. Uh, you're seeing prices that are at uh, record heights. And what that stems from is a lot of landlords who, who purchase their properties with pro formas in place that they need to hit. And not that they're willing to, to wait to hit those numbers, but they have to wait to hit those prices. Uh, you're starting to see what I call more of like a healthy plateau than a precipitous drop in, in pricing. And I think that's healthy and that's good. And deals are going to start to get done and then you're going to start to go through that, uh, that same cycle again over, over a course of years. But, uh, but deals are getting done on Madison Avenue. Besides the, uh, as you were saying, the Athletica type of companies, you know, over there, <clears throat> I mean, if you want to talk about Athletica, you're going to see uh, Sports Authority go out of business. They just filed Chapter 11, you know. Uh, a lot of that sporting chains haven't done well. The runner shops, the limited type of thing for the millenniums, for a certain group, have done better. Paragon? 
Paragon, but Paragon is only one location and it's institution. Which is a shame. Okay, but what about, you know, the discussion about Amazon opening up some bookstores? What's your thought about that? that Demi? Well, I'm a book lover, so that would make me very happy. Uh, well, there's a hole in the market for bookstores right now. Uh, the question is, are they going to be profitable? And then the next question is, do they need to be profitable? Uh, I don't think there's going to be an Amazon bookstore, per se. I think there's going to be an Amazon bookstore where you also have uh, different kiosks, where you also have an area where you can pick up uh, your goods that you purchased online, where you can return goods that you purchased online. I think it's going to be a, a massive center that just happens to have a big bookstore. You know, certain people would have said a couple of years ago, Circuit City died, and Best Buy would be dead. Best Buy is still around. Why? They may be the only one left. Go back. Well, well, you have to give, you have to give management some credit. <clears throat> and however they manage the transformation of that industry, they did it well. They're not opening new stores. So I, I got to give management credit. But in a similar management, as you say in management, Sports Authority, which was one of the original Kmart companies, where every one of the Kmart companies has gone out of business one way or the other, is going out of business. But Dick's Sporting Goods continues to grow. Um, you know, they're, they, they've been able to adapt. But let's look at this in another manner, and we were talking earlier about the shows. Look at the transformation of the grocery business, Okay. Remember, they were Bohack. I, I mean, today, there's no more Wallbaums. There's no more, you know, Food Emporium is just a franchise name over there. No, it's gone. It's gone, but I mean, there, there's some stores still have the name on it. Two of them in Manhattan still have the name on it because they, they kept that with a cooperative. Whole Foods is here. Fairway's on the last legs over here. Um, who do we see? Do we see a, do you, do you see a artisanal or a millennium supermarket chain? Yeah, I think you have. I think you've seen, you know, Whole Foods is an experience. It's unique. You walk in and yeah, you but, don't feel like you're yeah, in a supermarket. Yeah, but you know what? As my son said to me, it's called Whole, Whole Paycheck, too. And then you have Trader Joe's, and then you have this new store that's just opened up um, in the West Village called Mrs. Green's, which is, and you, and you walk in and it doesn't feel like a chain. It's, but Mrs. Green's is a chain. Oh, I understand, but, but it doesn't which, feel like What you may not be aware of is in the boroughs, the independent supermarket operators or food store operators are doing extremely well. What about the Aldis of the world? Doing well. In a Do you know way. what an Aldi is? I don't. <laughs> Never been to one. <laughs> so here's the, the point. There you go. You, Aldi is a family part of the Trader Joe's. It's the cousin of Trader Joe's. It is the probably the biggest uh, own brand operation in the world. Sure, it's okay. deep discount limited assortment. Right, deep discount limited assortment. Uh, basically, metal metal, no bags. You bring in your own bag to, to shop, and as somebody would say, it was more of a an urban type of retail originally in certain markets, okay? They went to, you know, the Dollar Trees of the, of the world, the family dollar stores and so on. Do you see that in Brooklyn? Well, Wegmans is coming to Brooklyn. Wegmans, Wegmans is going to be an interesting thing because Wegmans yeah. is one of, it's a classy operation. It's in the Whole Foods uh, mantra, the venue over there. It'll be different and, again, be interesting to see how people compare them. I crack up every time I say Bohack because the very first significant deal I ever did was a sublet of a uh, form of Bohack to become a, a Burger King. And when I tell people about Bohack, Bohack at one time was one of the largest. Uh, I mean, talk about their plant in Masspeth, Aaron. What, That's they, correct. They, they took, you talk about getting a screw out of a pig. They had a plant where cows came in in railroad cars. These guys butchered them and sold everything in a chain of stores called Bohack that. Today is just a, a that would do but, very well now. Well, well let's go back but, to but, the but, future. But look at look at AMP. Yeah, okay, you know the evolution over there. And, you know, we were talking about you know the yoga over there, uh, and you know the Soul Cycle, which which has done well. But the question is, if there is a recession, okay, I'm not talking about the coffee. People are going to do that because it's reasonably priced. The question is, you know, the equinox. The $300 a month 
and then they have their baby sister, which they don't really say is their sister, the, the blink, mm -hmm. and then the Planet Fitness, uh, you know, the $10 a month type of things. Uh, I, there was a guy, a member of the Friars, he says I, he had one company, a couple he just sold to uh, Crunch. Uh, he said, look, people put it on their credit card and they forget they have it on their credit card. They, you know, they're there for the 12 months over there. So where do you see the, the growth of what new companies for the it's, it's boutique for, fitness, right? So people are people that want you know a, a sort of pay per class model where you can go in and have a different type of experience. They say that uh, the big box model is is sort of folding. I think Equinox is more of a, a luxury experience, and people in Manhattan and in these markets. Well, what about Bob's Boot Camp? You know, in the Barry's. Barry's, Barry's, yeah. Barry's. Yeah, that's a that's a boutique fitness concept and. They're doing really well, and so you've got Flywheel and SoulCycle, and you know, on, on the higher end, there's there's brands like Tracy Anderson, and and I'm telling you, I hear of a new one every week. The big difference between them is that the major, the Equinoxes of the world, the New York Sports Clubs of the world, they're they exist and they're profitable because people don't go. Okay, wait, New York Sports Club is in trouble. New York Health and Racquet Club is a different. New York Health and Racquet. Right. They. they the, the model works because people don't go. Uh, if everybody who had a membership to Equinox Gym showed up on a weekly basis, they wouldn't be able to handle it. What about the idea right now, you know, Lifetime Fitness, who has these 200,000 square foot Mecca locations like in Long Island and in Westchester is opening up on, seven, uh, on 42nd Street to 70,000 square foot location? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm not sure that other than Equinox, as far as Big box gyms go, you know, 24 hour fitness is, I believe, subleasing all of their, or trying to sublease all of their spaces. It's Manhattan. And really, you know, New York Sports Club is, is shrinking. Um, and, and Equinox, I think, sort of stands on its own. I'm not, you know, there's probably room for another. Place. So, if, so as, I, as I rub my crystal yeah. apple, how do we look at retail over the next 12 months? Matt. I think you see the major corridors. The major corridors, uh, Fifth Avenue will continue to have to to, to do monster deals. Times Square, you'll consider you'll see uh, a few monster deals announced. Um, and the tertiary markets, you'll see the the in the side streets, you'll see a lot more boot, uh, boutique artisanal coffee brands and, and food tenants. The fast casual is on fire right now. Tenants are all tenants are expanding like crazy, uh, and major restaurant groups are looking as well. They're being a whole lot more cautious, but they're looking as well. Aaron, you got ten seconds, fifteen. I believe the retails will continue to learn that if they want to do big business, they have to be in the boroughs of the city of New York. Definitely agree, Timmy. Amen. It's going to become a, a stronger, more vibrant, more diverse market over the next twelve months. A lot of new creative concepts from the West Coast, from the Midwest, um, all within the health and wellness space. Okay, so the apple is shiny, and I'd like to thank Tim, John, Matt, and Aaron, and I'll see you next week.